The Detroit Tigers drop a series in D.C. to the Washington Nationals. Let's talk about it all today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked on Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Monday, May 22nd, 2023. Thank you so much for making Locked on Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team, every day. All righty. Well, the Detroit Tigers, as we said, dropped two of three to the Washington Nationals over the weekend. Uh, you know, I, I don't. We can just get right into it. I don't, I don't really have any big blanketing statements other than I tweeted this out as well. If the easy part of your schedule doesn't feel any different than the hard part of your schedule, if the team is playing pretty similarly against the the easy stretch, quote unquote, and the hard stretch, quote unquote, then that that's probably says more about you than anything else as a team, right? It's probably time for some some to look in the mirror and do some self reflection. That that was really a a big thing that I, I was just feeling throughout the weekend because it didn't feel a whole lot different, even though this is one of the worst teams we've played in a while. And yeah, here we are, dropped two of three in DC. Uh, let's just get right into it, and, and we can talk about the 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 performances from every facet of the game here by the team, and then at the end we'll kind of talk more in general terms. But uh, the the two biggest things from this weekend, okay? One was the offense outside of six innings on Friday. Really kind of same old story, different day as far as the offense goes. We'll talk about that later. The starting pitching and the lack of starting pitching depth is becoming more and more of a concern for this baseball team. We'll start with Matthew Boyd. Matthew Boyd gave probably the most on-brand outing I've ever seen. Uh, He had a no-hitter through five and still did not record a quality start because he couldn't get through the sixth inning. And gave up a home run, ended up giving up three runs. If he got one more out, still could have gotten a quality start if he went six. That would have been exactly six innings and three runs against for him, but uh, th- that's just like the epitome of his Tigers career. And it's it's late May now, right? We're approaching the, the last third of the month, uh, almost two months into the season. And the, despite Boyd leaving last year and then coming back, doesn't look a whole lot different as far as what he offers on the mound. And the production really is the biggest thing. Uh, does, doesn't seem to be like this different, completely different version of Matthew Boyd uh, that, that I don't know, maybe some people thought we were going to get. I, I'm not sure, but uh, pretty much the epitome of Matthew Boyd's career was that start on Friday. Alex Fiedo, uh, I thought that that was the probably the best out. I mean, again, Boyd was through five, was cruising and then just hit a wall there. Uh, but Fiedo was was pretty solid, I thought. He lost it late. Uh, the command kind of wavered a little bit late. Didn't have swing and miss stuff, which is so confusing. Alex Fiedo in general is confusing. This is a dude that when we drafted him was supposed to have this incredible slider, like this plus-plus slider. And at times, he'll still offer it and still show it. And you'll see and you'll be like, wow, that was a really good pitch. Got a swing and a miss. Got a, you know froze uh like buckled a, a hitter's knees like the he he can offer it but there's also some sliders he has that are just flat with little to no movement they're hung right over the heart of the plate and they get crushed and there's no consistency for the pitch pretty much none and the the fastball is good enough to if it's paired with a really good slider can still make him an effective and uh, pitcher at, at the major league level. I still believe that, but needs a third pitch. Haven't really seen any consistency on that front. We talk, we've been talking about that with Fiedo for, uh, I mean, ever since I took over this show, but even before, I mean, I, we've been talking about that with Fiedo for five years now, four years now, just doesn't really have a consistent third pitch yet still. Um, and 
needs consistency on his best pitch, which is presumably the slider. Uh, but all in all, that was not an awful outing, right? He gave, gives up three runs. Uh, the Tigers score two in the first inning. Like you're you're in the ball game for pretty much the entirety of the ball game. You're in it. Just again, the offense we'll get to later, but just uh, fell apart a little bit late for Fiedo. But um, certainly, as far as like ranking things that went wrong over the weekend, Fiedo is very very low on that list. That was a that was a solid, fine. I guess is the word I'll use. Outing. That was a fine outing. Uh, that I'm not going to complain too terribly much about. Just, again, the inconsistencies of some of his pitches. And then Joey Wentz. I have been probably the last person to, uh, like, and that's not how I wanted to word it. I have probably been the most patient with Joey Wentz when compared to a lot of people. Um, Joey Wentz, I, I still maintain the belief that since he added the cutter, he, he has looked like a better pitcher. But th they were too deep into the season at this point. And, and this is clearly something is off and not working. Uh, as far as what that looked like on Sunday, it was just way too many pitches out over the heart of the plate. Zero ability to paint corners. Uh, zero ability to get people to chase. Just everything was over the heart of the plate. Cutter, fastball off-speed, breaking stuff, whatever. It didn't matter. He was hanging curveballs. He, he was throwing, uh, he, he, like I said, he was throwing cutters like thigh high right over the heart of the plate. Just no no ability to like miss middle middle. Uh, it, it was, I, I don't want to say remarkable, <laughs> but it, it, was, it, it was wild. <laughs> it was pretty weird to, to see someone just consistently pound the middle part of the plate against major league hitters uh, and, and clearly just didn't have his best command in that one. And look like uh, even though he has given you some pretty solid starts this year, dude's got an ERA of like seven and a half at this point, kind of in the back of my head going into this weekend. This was like a really, really important start for, I think not only my opinion of Joey Wentz, but I think a lot of people's opinions of Joey Wentz. And this is now, of his last three or four starts, it's not very pretty. And that's unfortunate. And the reason why that's unfortunate is because there's nowhere else to go. The three through five in this rotation is going to be the biggest question mark this team faces for the next month. You're going to get Manning back in about three weeks, presumably, barring any setbacks, knock on wood, right? And then Scooble, while on, on Friday, what, during the mailbag show, I had made comments where I, I said I wouldn't surprise me if we got like normal, fully healthy Scooble by the end of July or even early August. Uh, an update was given over the weekend that injected a lot of optimism into the fan base about Tarek Scooble's current status. There's a lot of, uh, of people within the organization and beat writers and stuff that are implying that. Maybe it's a lot sooner than that. So I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to sit here and just flip-flop my answer and tell you. I, mean, I don't have a date. I didn't have a date on Friday. I don't have a date today uh, as far as when Scooble is going to come back. But there does seem to be a little bit more optimism that it could be a little bit sooner than, than I originally anticipated, which is great. But that still leaves you about three weeks-ish away, three to four weeks away. So the next month... You are really, really, really going to have to step up and try to find a way through and navigate your way through three through five in this rotation. Obviously, Boyd is not like going anywhere. He's going to be the third starter. That's just going to come down to can you get the good version of Matthew Boyd more times than you don't for the next month. But the bottom two especially, that Fiedo and Wentz duo, at four and five in this rotation, the, the the ball is in their court. If this team wants to keep its head above water and wants to maintain uh, even the appearance of being uh, uh, somewhat competitive in this division, again, maintain the appearance of, not necessarily maintain the actually being competitive in the division, but if you want to try and hang around, you can't throw out two 
I, I don't want to say automatic loss because, again, Fiedo pitched fine on Saturday and Wentz has had a f- couple, a few decent starts this season. But you have to get consistent pitching from the four and five in this rotation. And right now, that is just a massive question mark that I don't think it's fair to assume or presume that that is going to happen whatsoever. Again, Joey Wentz has like a 7-4 or a 7-5 ERA on the season now. And so you're going to have to figure out a way through the next month, and there's no one in the minors waiting. Wilmer Flores has like a 5-7 ERA in double A. Like there's no one that's just like waiting. No one. We went through that last week. And honestly, like three weeks ago as well. We've had this conversation a lot if you listen every day. So that's a big question mark. And that's something that really, really, really stuck out over the weekend. If you're going into a series and you're not getting, like the opposing team is missing Erod and Lorenzen and you're getting Boyd, Fieda, Wentz, that could smell trouble for the Tigers. And this is two weekend series in a row where that has been the case. Seattle, it was those three. And Washington, it was those three. Neither went very well. All right. Let's talk bullpen a little bit and then offense, obviously. And then at the very end, if we have time, we'll get into Kansas City because that's the next series. But first, I got to tell you all about our friends over at eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors with eBay's guaranteed fit. You can be sure every part you need to fit fits right. The first time around, just add your ride to the My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop at eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Uh, Second segment, I almost said third and final. Segment two, Locked on Tigers. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We'll be back tomorrow recapping game one of the Kansas City Royals series. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end as well. So uh, getting back into this weekend, so we talked about the starting pitching, the big question marks that are surrounding the team there. Bullpen-wise, There's one player we obviously have to talk about, but as a whole, this wasn't like some train wreck disastrous weekend uh, when it comes to the bullpen. On Sunday, the bullpen didn't give up any runs, even though the starter gave up six and didn't even make it through like the fourth inning uh, and kept – they got a ton of hits. They had runners on base the entire game, multiple runners on base the entire game at that, Uh, but still kept the Nationals off the scoreboard at least. That's fine. Uh, Saturday – one run given up by Holton and one given up by Vest. And then Friday is the day where like you had an eight nothing lead and then you won eight six and had to go to Foley and Lang there late. Um, yeah, you know, Boyd gave up three of those runs. So like we'll, we'll, it was eight to three when Engler came in. He, the thing with Mason Engler, and, and this is something that I've been saying for a very long time here is that if he can just not give up homers, he'll be fine. Like, you don't see Mason Engler go out there and have too many outings where he's giving up, like, oh, it's double after double after double, or, oh, like, he just gave up six straight hits or whatnot. And on Sunday, he had a shutout outing again. Uh, It's just he gives up homers a lot. And he doesn't really have a fastball, and yet he's a major league pitcher. And it's that's mind-boggling to me. I'm not sure whether to be impressed or nervous, probably both. But it, it, it's just it's one of those things where that is the next step in development for him. Just stop giving up so many home runs. 
And I know that that's like the worst possible thing you can do on the mound, right? If you if you're throw, looking at the possible outcomes for one pitch in a vacuum, right? You can throw a strike, you can throw a ball, you can throw a foul. You can throw a pitch that ends up being a, a, a single, double, triple. Like a home run is literally the worst thing you can do on a one-pitch-to-one -one pitch basis. So it sucks that that's like the worst part of his game right now. But his ERA is like 4-7. I want to say 4-7-5. And while that's not great by any stretch of the imagination, um, that's not even close to the worst ERA in this bullpen right now or in this pitching staff period right now. That's somewhat serviceable-ish for a multiple innings reliever. So the dude just really needs to limit the home runs. What? Golly. Uh, out, like I said, outside of that, I don't think it was a terrible weekend for the bullpen. Um, Foley, Alex Lang is unbelievable on Friday. He, he's just so good. Alex Lang, his ERA in the season is now under one. It's 0 0.98. He's absolutely incredible. His savant page is all red. He is one of the highest whiff rates in baseball yet again. Dude's incredible. Uh, four years of control left, I want to say, on him. That's a great piece that this team has, a great asset that this piece has. Um, a lot of fan bases think that they can just, like, trade for Alex Lang this year, which is weird. I'm, I'm not saying that's, like, completely impossible or that he's, like, this untouchable, ridiculous thing, but, like, it's just four years of control for a guy who's been one of the best relievers in baseball this season. I, it's not like an easy get for any team to just like willy-nilly get. That's a conversation for a later day. Uh, and then Foley, solid weekend as well. Uh, Cisnero, ERA in the mid-twos now, has been really solid in the month of May. Uh, yeah, like I said, they, they the bullpen wasn't a, an absolute train wreck. And uh, I, especially on Sunday, they held the Nats to six runs. Uh, Nats went two for 16 with runners in scoring position on Sunday. They had 18 hits, but 14 of them were singles. So you were kind of able to still keep them off the board in, in the last, you know, six innings of the ball game. Fine. Let's get to the, to the main event of the weekend, which in my opinion was the offense and the lack thereof. Uh, everybody had decent numbers on Friday. We'll start with that. Just again, four home runs. First time this season, the Tigers have hit three home runs in a game, and they ended with four. So that was nice. Friday was great. Great start to the weekend. Everybody's like, oh, my goodness, this is a, a series. We need to like we need to take two of three this weekend. The Nationals are worse than us. We, we just crushed them the first, you know, four innings of this baseball game. Then they get back into the game, obviously, and that was not fun whatsoever. Uh, but the offense kept scoring throughout the entire game. They had one run uh, in like the sixth, then one run in the in the seventh or eighth as well. Like they, it, it was a little bit stretched out. It wasn't just the clumped like, hey, here's a six run inning, and then they get shut out for eight. Like that, there actually was some some spreading out of offense, which was nice to see. Saturday and Sunday were brutal and was a nice little wake up call and a slap in the face to a lot of people, myself included, I think. Uh, Saturday, there's not just not too much to say. Uh, like no one came, showed up to hit. That was really in general terms, right? No one showed up. Torkelson had a home run in the first inning and then there was next to zero offense the rest of the game. I think after the first inning, they had four hits and none of them were extra base hits. Like just... I'm not sure they drew a walk on Sunday, or Saturday, rather. <laughs> Sunday, they drew plenty of walks. We'll get into that in a second. So, yeah, that, that was just uh, got out to an early lead and then went to sleep. We've seen that, unfortunately, quite a few times. This team is actually scoring early fairly often. It's just they have no sustainability. They, they score two or three runs in the first inning, two or three runs in the second inning, or not and. And then the rest of the game is is a lot slower. And that's been a theme throughout the month of May, unfortunately, as well. Let's talk about Sunday. Uh, we'll do that right after I tell y'all about our friends over at So Rare. So Rare is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game and marketplace that's transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 teams. Unlike other fantasy baseball platforms, So Rare managers truly own their fantasy experience. You can collect, buy, sell, and compete with player cards against global competition to win epic rewards. Win or lose, you still own your cards and there's no cost to play. 
It's super cool. They're uh, they're partnered with Juan Soto and Julio Rodriguez. You see their commercials all the time. It's really, it's growing and it's growing fast because of how unique and awesome it truly is. Just uh, really is a fascinating experience for you to have a fantasy team, quote unquote, but you actually own the the like the rights to the players on the team. And it truly is very, very fun and, and truly one of a kind. So go check it out. Head to so rare.com slash locked on. That's S O R A R E.com to draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup and start competing today to an epic rewards. Again, that's so rare.com slash locked on to start playing today. All right, everybody, welcome back. Third and final segment here, Locked on Tigers. I appreciate you all for tuning in as always. So Sunday, you had 14 base runners on eight walks, and you could not hit with runners in scoring position for anything. You went three for 16 with runners in scoring position. The only team in baseball that is worse than with runners in scoring position than the Detroit Tigers at the time of this recording is the San Diego Padres, who are massively underperforming, have a record similar to the Padres, or to the Tigers, rather. Uh, they have like a 190, 191 batting average with runners in scoring position. The Tigers is up to like 210. Or after this game, it's probably going to go down a little bit, 208, somewhere around there probably. Um, and yeah, you're the second worst team in all of baseball with uh, with runners on second and or third. So that's obviously a massive problem. This isn't a new conversation. If you listen every day, we've been complaining. Two weeks ago, we had an episode that was just called RISP, like copy and pasted 10 times. This has been a problem throughout this entire season. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime fast. Individually, there's a lot to go over really this weekend. Uh, Nick Maton, I guess, is who I want to start with. He had a decent weekend. I guess he walked a lot. He did have a decent weekend. Not, I guess the last pitch on Sunday was brutal. Took 99 down the middle on a full count, really rough, but I don't think the Tigers were really, that was with two outs. Tigers weren't really coming back and threatening uh, in that inning and in that game. Unfortunately, anyway, uh, they did every, the nationals did everything in their power to lose that game on Sunday. They walked you eight times and had errors. We're throwing the ball all over the place. Could not bring in a pitcher to throw a strike, and the Tigers just refused. Again, three for, what did I say, 13, 16? Three for 16 with runners of scoring position. Uh, yeah, so Maton had a lot of walks this weekend, a lot, and then he had the home run on Sunday, obviously. Uh, the last take was terrible, but I, I think that this is a part of development, maybe is the word, but like this is this is a, a strategy that he is implementing to try and see and hit breaking pitches better. And that's, he's just spitting on a lot of breaking pitches, right? He is just not even offering at a lot of them at the moment. And again, it led to a lot of walks, which is great. Well, I will take base runners. This team, I will gladly take base runners in any capacity. Uh, But the home run was great. That was a fastball, though. He now, if he's seeing breaking balls a little bit better, Right, if he's seen the breaking pitches uh, better and and is like seeing them into the glove and like okay, I'm I'm trying to get a feel for the timing. I'm trying to get a feel for the movement. I don't care if it's a walk or a hit. I just need to see them and get on base. The next step is obviously hitting them, and that's just something we still have yet to see. But I think that this weekend, I'm not going to call it like a big massive step in the right direction or anything, but it was at least nice to see him get thrown the kitchen sink when it comes to off-speed pitches and, and secondary pitches and still find his way on base. And not just like, good morning, good afternoon, good night, strikeout. Uh, Candelario, uh, like, was that not the most predictable thing ever? Like, tr- genuinely, is, is that, is, is any former Tiger really, but it was Jamer just completely tormenting the Tigers all weekend? not the most assumed and just like, yeah, that's going to happen. Let's see if we can win anyway type of mentality. That was always going to happen just because that's just what happens uh, against the Tigers. That's just our favorite thing to do. So, yeah, uh, he he did great. He, he was phenomenal, honestly. He looked really good in the box. Uh, what, like a week and a half ago, 
maybe it was even less. Maybe it was like a maybe it was about a week ago. We were talking about Jamer and, and the decision to let him go, and he was one of the twenty worst hitters in baseball at the time of that recording. And ever since that recording, he's been on an absolute tear. So like that's just how baseball works. Um, and yeah, he crushed the Tigers. I I'm not gonna be like, oh, I regret saying that, and we should have brought him back. Like I, I I still stand by what I said, which is that he might outperform who our third base production throughout the entire season. And right now, his OPS would be one of the higher OPS is on the Tigers because of this hot streak he's on. Um, yeah, I, I I've always maintained the fact that it was very possible that he. Uh, turned it around and and uh, was better than whatever we were going to put out at third base this season. Um, my biggest thing was just like down the road in the future. Is it really worth bringing him back this year if he's not going to be here in two, three, four years from now? If he's if he turns into some cornerstone third baseman and is the third baseman of the future for the Nationals, then like I'll I'll wear it and I'll eat that and I'll come on here and and talk about how wrong I was. But like I'm not going to change my opinion of him because he. <laughs> because he crushed the Tigers in a three-game set in May. Like, there's still a lot of baseball left. So we'll see what happens there. Um, Riley Green really struggled this weekend. Really struggled. Which is very frustrating because he has been crushing the ball. Ah, I shouldn't say this weekend. He really struggled on Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Um, Saturday, he faced a lefty. And we talked about the righty-lefty splits. And how in the minors, at some levels of the minors, he was better against lefties than righties. Well, that is certainly not the case at the major league level. Uh, yeah, Patrick Corbin just was in his head the entire game. Patrick Corbin also, I know a lot of people are like, how did you not destroy Patrick Corbin or whatever? The last two years, three years, he's been legitimately one of the worst pitchers in all of baseball. This year, he he has been a lot better. Just no excuse. I'm not saying, like, they, they should have done a lot more. It's still... 2023 Patrick Corbin I'm not I'm not making an excuse but he's not like the eight ERA guy that he has been the last two or three years either um so fine line there but yeah Riley Green really struggled against him greatly uh and he's gonna have to figure out how to consistently hit lefties and then on Sunday faced some righties and still kind of looked lost at the plate back to chopping the ball uh getting really on top of it chopping it to second base strikeouts just didn't look very good, so he's going to have to get back on the horse here against Kansas City. Andy Abanez has a 576 OPS on the season now. That didn't take long, did it? No, it did not. Started off 0 for 10, went on a huge hot streak for about a week and a half. It was awesome. It was beautiful. And now the last, I think they said he has one hit in his last, like, 26, 25, 26, 27 at-bats. Not great. He really struggled this weekend. Javi Baez, his OPS on the season is back down to 608. Dreadful. Uh, I think he only has a couple of hits in the last week. Has not been seeing the ball very well. Uh, is not striking out an insane amount, which is still weird, but still chasing a lot of pitches early, still just not able to barrel up the ball with even remote consistency. No hard hit ability at the present moment. Just very, very frustrating. And now he is, again, approaching in the wrong direction, approaching a 600 OPS on the season again, even though he was hot there for a little bit. Rough. Let's end on a hot note, though, on a high note, rather. Zach McKinstry was great over the weekend. A 785 OPS this season, Zach McKinstry now has. A 273 batting average, a 785 OPS. I tweeted out the production that the Tigers have gotten from leadoff hitters so far this year is an under 600 OPS, even though Zach McKinstry's OPS as the leadoff hitter is in the high 700s. He's been exactly what this team has needed at the top of the lineup. He draws a ton of walks. He puts together really good at bats. He gets hits. He gets on base. He has the ability to drive the ball into the gap. Um, he's versatile on defense, plays not like stellar defense anywhere, but he's not a liability defensively really anywhere. Really solid. Um, just good ABs. Like he works counts, but he also gets on base. Like Nick Maton works counts and doesn't get on base. Zach McKinstry works counts and finds a way to either get a hit at the end of it and get rewarded or draw a walk. He had a ton of walks this weekend. Obviously Sunday he had two or three walks. 
really, really solid and has been a, a big bright spot for this team so far. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much all I got. Like now you're heading into Kansas City um, and the Royals are awful. Like the Nationals are 20 and 27. The Tigers are 20 and 24, right? So like the, the, the Nationals, while they're still their last place in their division, um, they wouldn't be last place in your division, right? Like th that, that's not like a, a – and again, they get, they tried to lose Sunday actively the entire game. They were trying to lose Sunday. You could have won Saturday as well. You, you had plenty of opportunities uh, to, to to win that baseball game as well, and you didn't. And the, I, I just want to highlight there is a pretty comfortable difference between what the Royals have done this season and the Nationals. The Royals' offense has been a little bit better in May. Honestly, a lot of bit better in May than it was in April which is great for them. They're, they're, they're scoring a lot more runs, whatever. Sure. Offense is a huge uptick in production, especially in the first half of May. The Royals had. They have zero pitching. You're going to get Brady Singer, who has been legitimately terrible all season. He has an ERA of like almost eight. He got popped by the Athletics, who are one of the worst rosters I've seen. Like the, the, you're getting him, like you're you're getting veteran Zach Grinky. Now, Rich Hill and Adam Wainwright looked pretty decent against the Tigers, so that doesn't bode well for us, I guess. In Game Three of that, and then they haven't even announced who their Game Two starter is going to be yet. So, you you they have no pitching, none. Amir Garrett has been great in their bullpen. They don't have a whole lot back there besides him. Did I say Amir Garrett? I meant Aroldis Chapman. Aroldis Chapman has been great. Amir Garrett I was thinking of because of the Javi Baez rivalry. Uh, that's going to be very fun if it happens, potentially. I guess if we're on the losing side of it, then it's not going to be very fun. Aroldis Chapman, rather, has been really, really good for the Royals. Uh, back to throwing like 104. Outside of that, not a whole lot of production there. You have the ability to score runs. This team's offense was awful in April. And then in May has been like a bottom 10 offense in baseball. It hasn't been stellar. It hasn't been good. It hasn't even been league average. But it just seemed like it got this huge uptick because we weren't the worst offense in baseball for a few weeks. This is still a ton of holes in this lineup and a ton of, of question marks that need to be answered offensively and a ton of players that are still not providing a whole lot on the offensive side of the ball. So, heading into Kansas City, they don't have very good pitching. If there was ever a series to get right, it would be against the 2023 Kansas City Royals. And then after that, you have the White Sox. We'll talk about that later. Okay? All right. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We'll be back tomorrow recapping game one against the Kansas City Royals. Peace and love. Going to therapy's dope. I'll catch you all then, baby. Go Tigers.